HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. The great state of Wisconsin is home to the only master cheesemaking program outside of Switzerland. Learn more about Wisconsin's cheesemaking history at wisconsincheese.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported podcast network broadcasting over 35 shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. This year, we're celebrating 10 years of food radio. For the past decade, we've been taking you behind the scenes of farms, restaurants, breweries, school cafeterias, and so much more. It's been 10 years, and we're just getting started. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Hello, this is Lisa Held coming to you live from Full Service Radio at the Line Hotel in Adams Morgan, Washington, D.C. And you're listening to The Farm Report, a Heritage Radio Network show about the people, processes, and policies that shape how food is produced today. So last week we were talking about really big international issues related to agriculture and the environment. If you didn't listen, it was a really timely episode. My guest had so much valuable information to share, so definitely go back and listen to that one. But today I'm really glad that we get to shift gears a little bit and focus in on positive stories of individual farmers doing what they do day after day, digging in the dirt (laughs) and all the other stuff. My guest is Mary Ackley, farmer and founder of Little Wild Things, a farm that grows microgreens, shoots, and edible flowers in Washington, D.C. Mary, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I was reading a little bit about your background, and we were talking a little before the show. I understand you didn't come from a farm family, right? That's right. I did not. Grew up in the suburbs of Detroit. Perfect. Um, <laughs> so... I think, I think you have a really interesting backstory. Tell, tell us a little bit about the path that led you to farming. <laughs> well, it has, A little bit. Just, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to, it's been a long winding path, but I'll just keep it to the highlights. Okay. <laughs> um, I will say that even though I didn't grow up with a farming family, my parents and my family did instill a real sense of environmental stewardship. And I did mm. spend a lot of time outside. And, you know, I have always had a love of the outdoors and the environment. And so that's kind of the career path that I did take. Mm. I studied engineering, um, initially environmental engineering and worked in the private sector as an environmental consultant for a while. Um, and then I went off on some adventurous (laughs) activities in my early days. Um, I joined the Peace Corps and that really got me interested in sort of the broader issues around, um, environment and environmental right. engineering environmental challenges and um, that led me to go to grad school study natural resources management and then I ended up oh well, actually <laughs> first I I went and took an energy engineering job and worked on energy um, because it was a well-paying job at the time I mm. left grad school and um, you know I really wasn't sure exactly which direction I wanted to go in at that time um, 
but ultimately I ended up taking a job in the foreign service and right. I spent about 10 years as a foreign service officer with USAID living overseas and also here in Washington DC with travel overseas working on both environmental and agricultural issues. Um, and it was during that time that I became interested in farming as a career through reading and listening um, and also you know, somewhat through the work that I was doing and um, that's that's how Little Wild Things was born. <laughs> right. So, so what was the moment that you said, okay, I have all this interesting experience in engineering, environment, you know, natural resources. What was the moment that made you say, okay, you know what I'm going to do with all this? I'm going to start a farm. <laughs> well, there were, there were, it wasn't really one single right. moment, um, but it was really when I started reading, um, I'm sure many of the listeners know Joel Salatin and Polyface Farm. I read Omnivore's Dilemma and then started digging into Joel Salatin's books. And I really liked the idea that the most environmentally sustainable way to farm is also the most productive way to farm. And therefore, it would, make, it would lead to the best business outcomes. It would be right. the most profitable way to farm. So I was really interested in this idea that you could farm and make a good living doing it. So initially, my idea was not to start my own farm. My idea was to get an apprenticeship on Joel Salatin's farm. <laughs> <laughs> probably so, the idea of many young, <laughs> ambitious yeah. farmers. Go figure. It turns out there's probably like thousands of people with PhDs from Ivy League schools applying for this apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. um, so I applied, and I didn't get it. And so then I just was thinking, well, you know, maybe I could just start with something closer to home. I did look at other farms, but it's it's hard to really actually find information about if a farm is profitable or not. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of farms do take internships and or do have internships and apprenticeships, but um, until you, I don't know, maybe start that, I don't know how you get that information. So I right. just didn't feel comfortable leaving like a full-time career to jump ship and do that. So I thought maybe I could just start something small in my own backyard. And that's when I started actually, um, I came across Curtis Stone and his model of urban farming. Mm -hmm. Um, which is really interesting. There's a lot of farmers doing it now. It's like suburban model where they take front yards and backyards and there's enough, you know, if you can find a few front yards and backyards, it can turn into a small market garden if you put them all together. Mm -hmm. So I tried to find some land in Washington, D.C., like if I could find a friend's yard or something to start yeah. this like little garden and I couldn't find anything. And then I was on a run one day and I just, it just occurred to me that in uh, the biggest cities like Washington, D.C., the um, homeowners don't have land, but institutions do. Right. So I, I just started noticing there were larger pieces of land at schools and churches and things like that. And so I was on a run and I, I ran past, I kept looking at everything and I was like, this is too small, it's not getting enough sun. And um, I went to, I, I was running in my neighborhood one day and I passed by a monastery and I was like, this could work. And mm -hmm. so I emailed the friars and I just, I proposed my idea and that's how it all started. We got, a, we um, um, negotiated a little memorandum of understanding about how it would work and I started growing my vegetables and <laughs> wow, the rest is history. I started bringing it literally in a basket to my neighborhood pub and my local restaurants, so... And so they were just into the idea of having a farm on the property. They didn't charge you for the land. Well, I wouldn't say they were into my idea. They actually said no at first. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of a um, lot of details okay. here. I'm glossing over. But basically, right. they said no. So persistence pays off. I had initially been thinking of the, using the front yard because that's all I saw. Right. And they were like, no, that's going to be too public. But we do have this little space in the backyard where one of the friars had for many years been tending a small garden. And meanwhile, it's like December in Washington, D.C., and I'm, you know, having a hard time envisioning this. And I was thinking they probably were talking about, like, some raised beds or something, and mm -hmm. it wouldn't work. But I figured I'll just go anyways and just see. And so, lo and behold, you know, I went over there, and we walked. They led me down behind the monastery into the back, and <laughs> there was this... Well, at the time, it was very overgrown, and it was, like, the middle of winter, so it was hard to see, but it was, like, a quarter of an acre fenced-in place mm. that was a garden, had been a garden, and so um, I thought this could work. And, right. and I just... Um, they weren't really interested in money. I mean, I don't think yeah. they ever thought it would, like, turn into much, So, but they did like the idea of a young entrepreneur coming in and trying to do something good at the land, and I told them they wouldn't have to maintain it, and I would give them some produce in exchange. Right. So that's what we started. Now, of course, we try to give back a lot more, and we do donate weekly to a local homeless shelter called So Others Might Eat in the neighborhood, and then also to the monastery. So we try to do more as we have more. Right. 
And so that's where the farm started at the plot behind the monastery. Mm -hmm. Um, And how many locations are there now? So we still have that monastery plot. That's a major part of our operations. We just have that and then our indoor location where we grow our microgreens. Interesting. And what made you want to transition to doing indoor if you started with this outdoor plot? Yeah. So um, it wasn't necessarily that I wanted to. I always wanted to farm outside Mm. in a more traditional sense. But I also, want again, was aiming to make a living and have a profitable but profitable business. And so um, the microgreens just made sense because I knew that they had a shorter growing cycle. So I could grow a lot of them in a small space. And I had a market for them. I grew some microgreens as a challenge to myself for my first event, which was this thing in D.C. called Rooting D.C. Hmm. It's just a little like sustainable agriculture. It's, not, it's actually not little. It's a sustainable agriculture um, sort of conference okay. for gardeners and farmers. And so I went to that and I figured I could grow some microgreens for this. I'd never grown them before. I could sell them. So I did that and I sold out within like the first hour and I met my first customer, which is Chaya Tacos, who is one of our, you know, best customers to this day. And they've since expanded from farmer's markets to a brick and mortar store in Georgetown and now another one in Chinatown. So we've kind of grown together, another woman owned business. But um, all of that to say that microgreens a lot, made a lot of sense from that perspective. And another really important point is that I made a, what I now realize was a strategic decision at the time. I don't know that I thought of it that way, but um, obviously I didn't have much farming experience. So when right. I first started growing <laughs> all these crops, I messed them up a lot. And so I would make mistakes and I would run into problems. And then, you know, I'd realize, well, I can't grow this again until next year. Or, you know, I'd have two chances to grow it in a year, maybe three. And so it was just like a slow learning process. And it just occurred to me that the shorter days to maturity, the more learning opportunities I would have. And so I could become an expert quicker. And so I went to shortest days of maturity for basically everything. Mm. And that's how I ended up really focusing on the microgreens. We did do salad greens. We kept salad greens for a really long time. But then we made a unique shoot salad out of our microgreen products, which we could get a higher price for and, you know, was... Again, I mean, I think it's really flavorful and unique, but um, yeah. So, you know, a year later, I was an expert in all things microgreens, every variety, every potential problem, you know, everything that could happen in their growth cycle. So that was a really good decision. So was all of the learning just kind of hands on, learn as you go from your mistakes? Or did you do any like formal training for farming? (laughs) No formal training. Nothing. Um, I trained myself a lot, though. And I got a lot of great ideas from other farmers. So I really used a lot of information from, um, like, I mean, I would literally just look things up on, on YouTube. And this, um, this guy, or Curtis Stone, who I mentioned earlier, has a mm. farm called Green City Acres. And at that time, it was like one of the only farms I could find using that model. Um, there was also this group of farmers called Spin Farmers. And I would, I, I mean, I actually bought some of their resources, like how to grow quick greens. They had all these, they were very business focused, which was different from other things that I could find, other resources. So I went straight for the business focused resources. Mm. Um, of course, we are very, we care very deeply about sustainability and the environmental sustainability of business, but it's, um, I don't want to say mostly, but it's, it is, environmental sustainability is profitability. It is business sustainability. So it, the two are not, not separate in my mind. Right. Um, so I just went for the most business focused resources and that's how I learned a lot of YouTube videos and just a lot of trial and error, just figuring things out on my own really. Right. Um, and what does the growing system look like that you're using I mean, I think outdoor, you're in soil. Is Mm -hmm. it indoor? Is it hydroponic? It is not. So that, I think, probably differentiates us from a lot of urban growers. Um, We grow exclusively in soil, even indoors. And I am now five years in actually just realizing the full suite of benefits that that has for us and how we have avoided so many problems um, in the sort of controlled indoor environment because we do grow in soil Hmm. um, because the soil is like self-regulating. So we don't have a lot of the, we don't have any issues or haven't had knock on wood, um, (laughs) a lot of issues with that you might have with microgreens in a hydroponic environment, like fungus and mold. We just, we do not have those problems. We have a really healthy organic um, soil mix that comes to us from a local supplier called Veteran Compost. It's a mm. local veteran-owned business. Oh, wow. Um, and actually, it's kind of cool because he actually picks up kitchen scraps and kitchen waste from businesses, including some of our restaurants and oh, residents in, in the whole D.C. Baltimore region. 
and composts it and then creates our soil mix. And then he actually picks it up and recomposts it. So this is this loop where we're actually growing microgreens from the waste of the restaurants that we serve. So, yeah. That's incredible. And so the, the soil, is, do you think it's, is it because of the, the nutrients and the microbes in the soil are just making the plants are just healthier and so they're able to kind of resist the pests that you might get otherwise? That's exactly what it is in my mind. Yeah. I think um, one of the principles that I've always stuck to, which is that, um, is that rather, um, that nature kind of knows best, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think we're just scratching the surface of like what soil biology is. I mean, mm. it's insane. So like, you know, every time I learn something about a pest control method, for instance, at the outdoor farm, like we use the thing called actinovate, which is mm. actually inoculates the soil um, right. against mold and fungus. It's, it's like a biological symbiotic relationship. And it's just it's just incredible the complexity of the system. So to be honest, I don't actually know, but all I know is that we don't have any that problems. That it works, right? And I love that. <laughs> yeah, and then it prevents. And I mean, so. it's funny, like you were saying, you were looking for the most efficient way, the most um, you know, sus- economically sustainable way to grow and avoiding issues that you would have to address, like pest problems. That's yeah. also, probably also better financially, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and it goes back to the original principles that interested me that um, are used on Polyface Farm, where they basically try to harness the, the innate natural systems and how they work on their own. Right. So um, you're not battling against it, but you're actually using them. I, I wouldn't say that we're that sophisticated. I mean, we're, we're not using animal systems and all these other kind of integrations, but we, for what it's worth, I, I have always just felt that. And I think it's, it's playing out now in my experience that it's the best way to go. But then again, I, you know, I'm really by no means an expert in a lot of other farming methods. And I do, I do really believe that we should be innovating and trying lots of different things now, especially with regard to like just farming in general, but urban farming, I, there's so much innovation going on in vertical farming. And I really do think we need to try all sorts of different systems, really, really interesting things going on. But for us, I just do what works because <laughs> it's the path of least resistance. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so Chaya was your first customer. Mm-hmm. What does that look like today? Who are you selling to? Um, we sell to about 50 restaurants in the greater Washington, D.C. area. Um, we that That's everything from a very small, fast, casual farmer's market. Uh, so not very small, fast, casual, sorry. Farmer's markets to fast, casual, fast, casual chain restaurants even um, are actually have been very important clients for us because they've allowed us to scale a lot. Now fast casuals are really starting to care a lot about where their food is sourced and it, working with local producers to accomplish that. Um, but all the way up to Michelin star restaurants, um, also catering companies are really important customers for us. These a lot of microgreens and edible flowers, um, bakeries, and then also the general public. We do sell at the DuPont circle farmers market every Sunday and we sell, um, direct online to the consumer. Um, Um, And we also sell through one distributor in the region that allows us to reach, you know, customers, you know, in Northern Virginia and in Maryland. Sounds like you're producing a lot. We are producing a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Do you, can you quantify, do you have a way to quantify Um, how how much you're producing at this point? Yeah. So, well, I do know that our farm revenue puts us in the top 8% of farms in the country, which is a little bit crazy because we're actually a very small business. (laughs) Wow. But it turns out that most farms, um, you know, the vast majority, I think 76% of farms, according to the USDA census, the most recent census, Mm -hmm. make less than $50,000 a year in revenue. So there's a very, the numbers get really small after that. Um, There's probably then a huge gap where there's like no one. And then the bigger farms that are, you know, there's a huge, then there's, there's these huge farms that are bringing Mm -hmm. in a lot of money. So we're a small business by every standard. Um, but we have grown a lot. I think last year we produced about, I want to say 6,500 pounds of produce, which may not sound like a lot if you're, you know, a root crop farmer, but for microgreens, Mm. (laughs) it's a lot. And I think it was about 600,000 edible flowers. And we're going to be doing double that. We're on track to be doing double that for sure this year. Um, But that was for 2018 numbers. That's incredible. Wow. (laughs) Um, We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more with Mary Ackley from Little Wild Things Farm. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. Did you know that 90% of Wisconsin's milk is made into cheese? 
And this is not just any milk. When Swiss, German, and Italian cheesemakers first settled into Wisconsin, they chose their new home because of the special terroir of the region. Its soil and water are nurtured by the goodness of glacial sediment, and those elements lend themselves to the very best milk. Today, Wisconsin produces 25% of all cheeses made in the U.S., and Wisconsin cheeses have won more awards than any other state or country in the world. How do they do it? Wisconsin cheesemakers combine their heritage and tradition with nonstop innovation. They were the first state to establish cheese grade standards and the first to require that every cheese plant be overseen by a licensed cheesemaker. Wisconsin is the only place outside of Europe where one can pursue an elite master cheesemaker certification. All of these impeccably high standards mean Wisconsin produces more than 48% of the nation's specialty cheese. I hope you're enjoying this podcast. And you know, Heritage Radio Network has thousands more. Hi, my name is Linda Palaccio, and I'm the host on A Taste of the Past here on HRN. Join us on a weekly journey through culinary history, where we explore the when, where, what, and why of food throughout history. You can find A Taste of the Past wherever you listen to podcasts and on heritageradionetwork.org. All right, we're back. This is Lisa Held. You're listening to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network, recorded at Full Service Radio in Washington, D.C. I'm here with Mary Ackley from Little Wild Things Farm. We've been talking all about growing microgreens and edible flowers in D.C. Um, We are now going to take a quick break from that conversation to do our new weekly segment, Farm Bill 5. Five minutes where we talk about the farm bill. So... If you listened last week, just a quick refresh since this is pretty new. The Farm Bill is the most important but also most mind-boggling piece of food and farming (laughs) legislation in our country. And the goal of this is to help listeners better understand agricultural policy. And so we're just reading the Farm Bill. So, Mary, (laughs) I chose a section for you that applies to urban agriculture Um, There are a few others that relate to grants for urban ag and other issues in the space, but we can only do one at a time, obviously. So let's hear it. (laughs) All right. I'm a little bit scared, but I will do this for you. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Section 12302, Urban Agriculture, Subtitle A of the Department of Agriculture Reorganization Act of 1994, as amended by Section 12202, is amended by adding (laughs) at the end the following. Section 222. Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production. In general, the Secretary shall establish in the Department an Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production. Director, the Secretary shall appoint a senior staff official to serve as the Director of the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production, referred to in this section as the Director. Mission, the mission of the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production shall be to encourage and promote urban, indoor, and other emerging agricultural practices, including community gardens and farms located in urban areas, suburbs, and urban clusters, rooftop rooftop farms, outdoor vertical production, and green walls, indoor farms, greenhouses, and high-tech vertical technology farms, hydroponic, aeroponic, and aquaponic farm facilities, and other innovations in agricultural production, as determined by the secretary. So, (laughs) great job. Um, It's funny because I, I feel like you looked and you were like, oh, God, this is, like, you know, wonky. And But the funny thing is that this week... It actually is English, and you can kind of figure mm-hmm. out what it's all about. Last week, the section that I gave my guest Glenn to read was just pure gibberish. I mean, <laughs> it was unintelligible. Um, so just really quickly, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about what it was that you read. So the 2018 Farm Bill, for the first time, instructed the USDA to create this, quote, Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production to encourage and promote urban agriculture in its many forms. The issue is that exactly how that office will be formed and how it will fulfill that mandate is still up in the air. It hasn't actually been established yet. Um, And the big thing to understand is this was written into the Farm Bill authorizing annual appropriations of $25 million. That is as opposed to mandatory, mandatory funding. So what that means is Congress can appropriate that money for them to create this office, but they might not. So there's a chance that that money won't actually end up there. And while this office is authorized to be created, it won't be because the money won't be there. So I thought that was kind of a good, just a good example because there's a lot of stuff in the Farm Bill that 
gets passed and you're like, oh, wow, it says we're, they're going to do this. And then the money isn't mandatory. So it just never happens. So hopefully that won't be the case for this. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Um, all right, so back to our conversation about Little Wild Things. Um, actually, I think maybe given the fact that we were just talking a little bit about this Office of Urban Agriculture um, that might exist in the federal government, um, I did want to ask you a little bit about urban agriculture overall in Washington, Washington mm-hmm. D.C. So you've been doing this now for five years. Yep. Um, and, you know, I'm new to this city, and we haven't on the show ever talked about urban agriculture here. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, just can you give listeners a little bit of a sense? Like, what does the landscape look like? Are there a lot of people growing food within the city? I think there are, yeah. Um, we're one of multiple commercial urban farms. Mm. And then, of course, there is a, you know, a vi- very vibrant um, community of people who are interested in gardening and that type of scale of urban agriculture. Um, I was actually involved in helping to found one of the community gardens in my neighborhood. Mm. So there's a very vibrant community around all of that. Um, there are also some educational um, nonprofit urban farms. There's Common Good City Farm. Um, there's Rooftop Farms. Uptop Acres is one that I know of. Um, there's another urban farm actually at the same location where our indoor farm is located. It's called Cultivate the City. It is on the roof there. Um, they have a strong, again, a strong education focus. They're very different from us. Um, so we don't compete. We are, we have a great collaborative relationship or actually we're, we have, but now we're going to even launch into like a new era of that because we're located in the same facility. But, um, yeah, I don't know too much about how it compares to other large cities Mm -hmm. but I do know um that in other large cities you know you there are these very very large like aeroponics and um you know um, Gotham Greens and these other very large New um, York has a ton yeah New York Chicago Chicago has um, a lot too so to my knowledge I don't think we have any of those operations but I think that they will be coming um and yeah yeah is there a community of urban farmers do you know a lot of the other farmers Yeah, I think so. Yeah, especially because, you know, again, luck plays into our success story, too. I think I just started around the right time, um, around the time that some of the farms that I mentioned started. So we, I guess, for lack of a better term, like have grown up together in a way. (laughs) Um, So definitely I've received support from them. We've shared ideas and all of that. I think everybody is just so busy, though, that it makes it hard. Right. Like when you're starting and growing a business, um, it is hard to take time to, you know, also participate in the community sometimes. And that also extends to a lot of the conversations that you're having around policies and things. Like I wish I could be more involved in those things, but the reality is I haven't had as much time as I would have liked. Um, We have a food policy council here in Washington, D.C., and I've participated in those meetings, and there's an urban agriculture group Mm. within that, but I can't participate nearly as much as I would like. And, you know, there's urban agriculture um, support here in Washington, D.C. too. But again, I haven't accessed it as much because it's just never seems to be applicable to me at the time that I need it. And right. it's the timeline of a business is fast. <laughs> the timeline of government is slow. So right. I just go and I do what I need to do when I need to do it. And uh, because of that, I, don't, I have not accessed a lot of the support or resources that might be available. I just assume that there's no support and operate from that. <laughs> right. We'll hope that there is, but we won't. Yeah. <laughs> um, one other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit, um, sort of for the end of the show, kind of these bigger topics. Um, you started to talk about how you decided to grow microgreens because, well, one of the reasons is that econo- the economics make mm-hmm. a lot of sense, which I didn't even, I hadn't thought of, but I guess that short growing, like you're, yeah. you can grow them really quickly to maturity. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I'm curious, you know, I, I know I've heard a lot about how they're so nutrient dense in terms of the vitamins, phytonutrients, um, but they don't really provide a lot of caloric density. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm curious, so just like from a local food perspective, um, how do you think about like how microgreens fit into like feeding a local food like a local community and um, like what, what role they can play in a person's diet. Yeah. Um, well, I think so there are different, so there's a lot of different types of microgreens. Mm. So 
yes, micro herbs and things are, are pretty, um, pretty light <laughs> <laughs> calorie scale, which could be a good thing. Yeah. Um, but we also have things like sunflower shoots and mm. pea shoots, which are a lot more hearty. Uh, sunflower shoots, I know actually have like, uh, protein and fat content. Huh. Um, pea shoots can be sauteed and really be the centerpiece of a meal. So we do grow things. Um, we have ready to eat salads that have a base of shoots and then they have mixed microgreens on top and edible flowers. So you can make mm. a composed salad from that. Um, so I do think that they can play a role. Um, certainly they're not gonna, you know, f- I, I just, I don't have any, um, I don't really, I guess, I don't know how to say this, but I haven't, <laughs> I don't want to say I haven't thought about it. That sounds mm. terrible. But again, I am trying to prove, uh, we're on a mission at Little Wild Things to prove that, um, you know, sustainable agri- agriculture can be commercially successful in mm. urban landscapes. So I'm trying to make a living and try and do that in an environmentally sustainable way. So the reality is like, I can't solve every problem with the food system. And so, um, I just try to provide a really beautiful, delicious product. And then I, you know, do let people decide whether or not they want to buy it in Washington, DC. I mean, we have a huge market for this. I mean, I can't believe the success we've had, um, at the DuPont circle farmers market, for example, like customers coming back every single day, um, and so we do try to make our microgreens as affordable as possible because we try to produce them as efficiently as possible, again, for the best business outcome. Right. So it's all kind of like tied together in my mind. But definitely we, we want to sell locally. I mean, that's why we are a local business. And um, we want to grow the greens as close to the customer as possible because then they'll be the freshest and the best product. So Right. Yeah. No, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I mean, I, I think that's, that's like the interesting thing is if coming at it from this idea of like, not just growing the food that you're like, oh, you know what, I want to grow broccoli or I want to grow just kind of like deciding what you want to grow based on who knows what, <laughs> but deciding based on like this, this will be economically viable if we grow that, like that, that might be a question that a lot of people aren't maybe asking enough. Right. And, and maybe like to grow, to grow local food economies, maybe it does involve like shifting what, what we eat, the kinds of vegetables or the kind, you know, and, and so microgreens could be part of that. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I always hear, I, I heard this somewhere, but I think it's like a really common saying in business is just like, find your customer first. Mm. Like don't create your product. Like you want to find your customer, your market, and then you, you create your product to fill that. And so, um, that's kind of how it worked with me. Like we found our first customer with Chaya and then we grew with them. Like we scaled as they were scaling and then we got more and more and more customers. So like we knew there was a market for microgreens too. That was another reason why we produce them here. Right. Um, because we have all these wonderful restaurants that are willing, to, willing and able to support, you know, this type of local food production. So, right. What, can you give us some examples of what restaurants are doing with them? Like different cool uses? Yeah. So, um, oh my God, there's so many, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Um, so tacos, not only Chaya, but we have another, um, awesome restaurant partner called Espita. Mm-hmm. Um, and they use our sunflower shoots to tap all kinds of, um, authentic Mexican dishes. And so, um, it's just beautiful. And the texture of the sunflower shoot is just so wonderful on, on, um, on their dishes. It's just, I don't know what it is. If you've tasted, have you tasted sunflower shoots? I don't think I have. Oh, I should have brought some, but I mean, I'm thinking like, they're just so nutty and like the texture is just so important to Mm. the taste and their, um, and the experience of eating them. So they're great. Um, but we also sell, you know, wheatgrass, which is used in juice, um, juice shops and juicing. Um, we sell, oh my God, there's so many, I just don't even know where to begin. Um, we have a fast casual, um, Indian restaurant called Rasa that uses, we have, we make a special microgreen mix for them um, with the flavors and colors that they want to top their dish. And so we do that for a lot of different places. We do that for Haleo, which is um, one of Jose Andres' restaurants, Mm -hmm. by the way, they are a huge supporter of putting their, you know, local farms and putting their money, you know, where their mouth is in terms of supporting local farms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we work with all five beefsteak restaurants as well. And so, uh, you know, there's just so many. Um, another really cool use is um, masubi, the Hawaiian rice balls. Uh, we have Le Musubi is this really cool um, company that sells at farmer's markets. And she uses our edible flowers and microgreens to top the masubi. So, yeah. Cool. What about at the market? What do people buy? What are some of the best sellers 
when you're actually selling direct to consumer? Yeah. So sunflower shoots by far the huh. number one. And then our spicy mix, which is radish, arugula, and mustard microgreens. It's just like great on sandwiches, wraps, tacos, eggs, like literally anything you can think of. Um, and we are trying to go as much as possible plastic free, single use plastic free. So we now sell everything in bulk and people can bring their own container or if they don't have their own container, we give it to them in a paper bag and then they take it home and put it in a reusable container. So we've kind of really reduced like our product mix because of that, but it seems to work fine. So we sell just the sunflower shoots, pea shoots, spicy farmer's choice, and then we kind of rotate some different um, specialty blends in there. Um, surprisingly, I would have never guessed this, but micro fennel is like so popular at the market. Huh. We have like a whole following of people that just like want micro fennel. If we don't bring it, <laughs> then they're not going to be happy. So <laughs> who, who could have predicted that? That's so yeah. interesting. But also edible flowers. And then we sell a really cool product, um, cocktail kits. So we had the idea that we would put in one clamshell all the flavors that we'd use for a cocktail. So like floral, spicy, bitter, sour. And so the cocktail kits contain things like micro celery for Bloody Marys, but nasturtium for spiciness and floral flavors, micro shungiku, which is micro edible chrysanthemum. And so there's just, yeah, there's so many cool things. (laughs) The the plastic uh, aspect is really cool too. Is, are you able to do that with restaurants as well? Um, some, so, um, You know, it depends on the restaurant, but for example, with Chaya, I mean, they've worked really hard to um, partner with us on this and we, we use reusable containers. We've been using that since the beginning and now Mm. they have two, you know, stores and they're getting a lot of volume of micro grains, but we still put them in these larger reusable, like Rubbermaid type containers. And then we just pick them up every week and we wash them and we bring them back. Um, For smaller amounts, it's a little harder, you know, if it's a customer that you're not going to maybe isn't going to buy every single week or something, but we try as much as possible. So yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, All right. So we're going to wrap up in a minute. Last question. What's next for a little wild thing? (laughs) Well, we just moved into, um, I want to call it our permanent home, but it's actually a seven year lease, but that's still really amazing. But it's new, a um, new space? Well, it's, it's, it was a repurposed space. Uh-huh. It had been a parking garage and used as a, was being used as like warehousing for, this is very interesting, um, the oldest family owned hardware store in Washington DC called Jenks Hardware. Huh. And um, we worked with them. They're technically our landlords, but I, I think of them as an amazing partner. They've been so, so, so supportive of like, helping another small business be successful. Um, and then, you know, they really saw the value in us coming to partner with them. So it's adjacent to the hardware store's main showroom. Okay. And it is our own private space. It's a 4,000 square foot uh, production facility. And so it's not brand new, but we renovated it. Got it. Yeah. So anyways, having this space is going to allow us to finally make some of the investments um, in things that are going to really um, make us more efficient that we haven't been able to invest in yet just because we didn't have that permanent um, space where we knew we could we could make those investments. Right. So a lot of growth. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, Mary. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all so much for listening to the farm report on heritage radio network. If you enjoyed the conversation, please subscribe to the podcast, rate it and share it. I'll see you next week. This program is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com backslash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.